Okay, so let's uh, let's go ahead and jump into this. My name is Vince, and I just want to welcome everyone to another presentation of NoVeg's Best of the Best webinar series. We're excited again, not only to be, or we're excited to be presenting ZBrush once again. I don't know if anyone attended our presentation a few months back, but we had a great response from it, so we decided to do another one as soon as we could. Uh, I want to thank Paul once again for uh, presenting. We also have uh, Jamie Libel from PixLogic on board to help answer some of the questions as they come in. Um, before we get started, I just want to give a little background on Paul. Um, he's PixLogic's 3D application engineer who works with several studios including Legacy LegacyFX, Disney Animation, Bad Robot, and Pixar. He works with them on enhancing their digital sculpting pipeline using the leading industry application, ZBrush. Um, he is also involved in the development of ZBrush and works with artists around the world offering support. As part of PixLogic's team, he travels to various studios and schools giving demos on ZBrush to, the, to highlight the various tools within ZBrush. Um, Paul graduated with a Bachelor's in Fine Arts from the University of Bowling Green and was an extension student at the Nomon School of Visual Effects. So needless to say, Paul is truly a pro. He's great at what he does. Um, we're excited to have him on board once again. I think once you see his presentation, you'll see that he's really the best at what he does. Paul's going to speak for the next 40 minutes or so. Um, during that time, everyone will be in listen-only mode, but definitely feel free to shoot your questions into the question box. Um, as I said, Paul and Jamie will be on board answering questions as they come in. At the end, we'll also open it up for a Q&A. We'll get to as many questions as time allows. Um, last thing I want to touch on, we will be recording this webinar, so if you have to leave early, or you want to view it again later, I'll give you guys complete details on where to find the recording as soon as Paul's done. Having said that, I want to turn it over to Paul so we can jump right into this. Paul, are you there? I'm here. Okay, I'm going to switch the screen to you and let you take it from here. Oh, very exciting. Here we go. Do, do, do. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. Hi, Tomas. Uh, so uh, let me know if you guys can see my screen, number one, and that you can hear me all right. So drop that in the little question section. So at least I know that uh, I'm broadcasting good and that you guys can hear me. So um, really quickly, obviously, I'm, I'm on the, the Novich website right now, which obviously this is a spot where you guys can go and to purchase your copies of your Mac or Windows version of ZBrush or R3. So it's really great to team up with uh, the resellers, uh, Novich, and bring you guys these webinars. So <clears throat> I just wanted to uh, make sure you guys are aware of that and that you can get it here as well. So um, a quick couple of things that I want to touch base on. Um, I'm not sure if for those who, how many are new ones there. Um, hey, Brian. What's up, buddy? Coming to SIGGRAPH? Super. So I'm going to be looking at, so my random talk right there is going to be me looking at the uh, question window. So I do have it open. So feel free to throw questions at me as I go. Um, in fact, I prefer that. Um, as we're moving along because it's better to ask the question while we're actually working on something. That way it's going to be more convenient for you guys because I don't, if I'm building something, I don't have to try and rebuild it really quickly to answer your question. So feel free to go ahead and uh, throw them at me. Hey, Cameron, great to, great to have you here. Um, so uh, feel free to throw that on there. Um, so Ricky, you're good now. You can see my screen. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, George, you had a quite quick question. For those that are new users, George is asking a question that he's a new person to ZBrush and sculpting, and he's asking what type of project should I practice to build my skills in sculpting. Well, we're going to dive a little bit in, into Dynamesh today. So the, what we're going to do for Dynamesh is probably one thing that I would do to practice. So I would definitely, uh, the first thing we do, that's one thing I would do to practice. And another thing is watching these videos. So the reason why I have RZ Classroom up is you can see this little this little thing right here. I'm actually going to show you guys how I did this in the video. And the reason why I also like to do this is I can do it in this webinar, and if you don't remember, you know that you have something here to refer back to. So you have our website as well to just watch me redo this part in the video. And then, you know, I'll take it other places in a webinar and do other things. But I like to use some of these videos. So well, there's a lot of this stuff we'll be looking at, and I'm going to be covering Dynamesh, which there is a new series um, 
on all Soul-Z Classroom by Michael Popovich right here, which is five parts. So there's the four parts up right now, and there'll be a fifth part coming soon. I also want you guys to be aware, for those that are new or those that are used to ZBrush Central, I'm sure you probably noticed this new feature in ZBrush Central where we're putting up, now when we actually release a video, which we're releasing pretty much, trying to release at least one per week, if not more. So anyone that say new is something that we've just put out with, up within the last two weeks. So you want to check these out, and we'll be going through these, these items, because I also want to spend some time with Noisemaker, because it's a feature that I think is really strong, and I'm just not seeing a ton of it used on ZBrush Central. So I just want to, I want to show it to you guys and push it that way. So this is something new to ZBrush Central, so keep an eye on this as well. And of course, those that are new, definitely you want to come here for the community. Um, Cameron's on this meeting right now. Here's a post from Cameron right here, from Cameron Farm, using uh, a ZBrush to do silhouetting and things like that. So for his, uh, his Red Sands characters. So this is great. And people like him, and thanks, Cameron, for sharing this stuff with the community. And this is the cool thing about our community. They're all sharing things and uh, going about showing how they did things. we got the Mass Effect interview here with multiple other interviews. So I highly, highly recommend. I know one of the questions was to, hey, how, what would I do to practice? For me, this is how I got started. I just started looking at stuff. I cry in my pillow and, and sweat away the night saying, I'll never sculpt this good. But then it really is just about the more you sculpt, the better and better you're going to get. It's the old cliche, practice makes perfect. It's so true. And you learn, you know, continue to learn things. I think art is a, a moving motion thing that will never stop discovering things. So I, I'd strongly recommend going forth and using ZBrush Central. So let's go ahead uh, and dive into that, OK? So, so I see the, the QRE measure. I couldn't say for sure what exact date. We're working on it. We're adding a couple little things. Uh, we'll get to that near the end. So here's something is what I started with. We're going to come to come to this. But I also want to show this because a lot of this, what you're looking at, is actually Dynamesh itself, OK? So I threw this together really quick to actually make that video. You know, it took me, I don't know, maybe an hour or so to do it. So, but I'm also calling this out, and I want to do this, which I'd be happy to show how I did some of this. Um, but if you notice, the, what I'm highlighting right now, you know, is actually all Dynamesh. Every part of it is Dynamesh. So, and I, I made them kind of separate sub-tools and made a couple quick things. But this is also another way to use Dynamesh. But I want to start off being more simple with Dynamesh. So I'm just going to grab something to a us here. And this is also going to the people that are kind of new to ZBrush. So we have something that is a sphere. I'm going to turn on my symmetry mode because I obviously want to sculpt on axis of the X. Okay, I want to sculpt on both sides. So there's a new thing that I, I a lot of people I don't think are noticing as well. When you have symmetry mode on, if you notice my brush size too, I want to call this out because right now it's really difficult to see if I'm in symmetry mode. But I know I'm in symmetry mode. If you see you have your inner circle and you have your outer circle, and you see that outer circle has two circles really close on that brush size. So if I hit the X to take me out of symmetry mode, you see that it doesn't have two anymore. That's actually an indicator for you as a user that there are, you are in symmetry mode. So that's something we added to this version because as an artist, you never know where you're going to be in your model, especially if you're working on something really close and you're working on it in a hand. Now you have an indicator. Just like, for example, if I was like this, I know just by looking at the brush size that I'm in symmetry mode. See, this is saying I'm not in symmetry mode. This is in symmetry mode. So I just want to call that out because I actually came up in my last webinar. Um, so I actually wanted to call that out. So looking at our mesh that we have here, and looking at we have three subdivision levels, I'm sure some of you have used Dynamesh and some of you have not used Dynamesh. So I just want to kind of cover the quick little basics, and then I want to dive into all the features of Dynamesh. So when you start pulling on geometry, especially for those that are new to the sculpting and 3D world, you start doing this. And let's say I just start making some kind of creature character that kind of has some kind of human element to it. You can see what starts to happen with our geometry. right? We really start to stretch it out, okay? especially in this area right here. Even if I try to smooth it back, it's still really stretched. And it's got something that's going to give me problems. But when I start forget about details, if I just want to start saying, OK, the eyes are going to be over here on this creature, right? You can see all this that's happening. Now, of course, we can divide up and get more polygons and keep dividing up and getting more polygons, right? But why, why would I want to do that? 
when I can just use, if I'm at this stage where I'm just designing my character, and I don't want these geometry to do this, why not just turn on Dynamesh? So when I turn on Dynamesh, because I have subdivision levels, we're going to ask you if you'd like to freeze your subdivision levels. Okay? So I'm going to say no, right, really quick, just to put this in a Dynamesh mode. And before I start diving into Dynamesh, I really want to show off that feature, which is the free subdivision levels, because I find myself using it to save me in sculpts and just do certain things. So I'm going to open up my light box here on the top, and let's just grab the demo head really quick. Okay? And looking at this, he has three subdivision levels. So let's say I wanted to add some, some horns to this guy. Okay? I can actually say, you know what, let's freeze subdivision levels. What we do is we hide your subdivision levels. Okay? We're on the lowest level, and let's go ahead and add some horns. And I'm going to use my selection tool. So I'm going to say maybe it's a big horn like here, and this is where I want the horn to go. And I'm going to go and unselect portions that I don't want to be of the horn. Okay? So I'm just saying this section right here is where I want horns to come out of. So I'm going to mask that off and then bring everything back. Okay? I'll try and give you guys shortcuts as much as possible, but I also want to make sure I get everything to you guys. Um, the, uh, the silhouettes uh, that Patrick uh, is asking for Cameron, you want to watch those videos. Also, Say's article uses 3D to do the same kind of thing, too, and there's a video of him doing it at our last UGM, which I'll get to. So remind me at the end, Patrick, to show you. Also, Cesar's and Cameron will come back to that. So I'm going to inverse my mask, and I'm just going to switch to move mode. And here's another new feature that I find myself using a lot in Dynamash. I find myself using it in a ton of things. So what we can actually do now is extrude. So when we extrude, we're just adding another edge loop. So it's really quick and really easy. So what I'm doing is just holding the control key and clicking on the center, center circle of my move mode of the transpose line, and there you go. So now I have some horns that I can get going, okay? I say that's great, but now how do I get all that great hard work sculpting that I did down the line back? So all I have to do is click the free. What we're going to do is give you back your subdivision levels and give you back your sculpting de detail, but then still give you all that geometry that you need here for the horn. So now I have that geometry supported here for the horn, so now I can start going ahead and start sculpting on this. So that's really cool to be able to do that. So that's one way that we can use um, the free subdivision levels. So let's look at it for a Dynamesh sake, looking at it now, because we want to dive deeper into Dynamesh. Um, so, for example, I want to make some crazier horns. I don't want even these horns. So if I want to, let's, let's move these down and make them just little horns. Okay? So I have subdivision levels. All right? So when I turn this in Dynamesh, you get that warning. So now you know what's happening is we're getting free subdivision levels. I'm actually going to say yes this time. All right? So I'm going to make sure I'm in Dynamesh mode. Okay? And then I have my free subdivision level button is on. You can see what ZBrush is going to do in Dynamesh. ZBrush's Dynamesh needs to be watertight. So we're going to close off any of the holes. So in the eyes there was holes and down here there was holes, which is fine. I'm just going to want to now use a different tool. And I'm going to dive deeper in this tool, but I just want to get our blood flow in here and get our thoughts thinking. So I'm going to switch to the curve too. And what's really cool about this is I can draw something out like this, and then there you go. Now I got some crazy horn going on. And right now it's disappearing. So if any of you that are use that have been using this and they're doing the same thing I'm doing, the reason why he's disappearing is because I have solo mode off. So I'm going to turn solo mode off so he doesn't disappear. And then what's great about this is I can edit this. Right? I can say the horn is too, too large, so I'm going to change my draw size here. And then just click on the dot. And then voila, spaghetti type horn. So cool. There. There. So what I like to do is I want to put a taper to the horn. So we, in this curve mode, we have a bunch of features. Okay? So I'm just going to look at what's just the curve mode here. Right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn size on here. And then now I have this graph that I can use. So when I click now on this dot, it starts to taper down that horn. And what's using that taper is this graph. So if I do something a little more crazy like this, okay, and then click on it, you'll see you'll, you'll get that taper down, right? You'll get in the, the variation. That variation is happening because my curve is varying. 
So I can con even control how much of the taper I want by changing that. Now you see the horns that I have, okay, compared to what I had before, kind of taper. So by default, Dynamesh is going to mask off whatever you've added to it. So in this case, I'm adding a tube. So I'm going to unmask, and then I'm going to hold down the Control key again, and click and drag again, like unmasking. And now you can see this has been welded together, and I can switch to my favorite brush, which is the clay buildup. And I use this on every single sculpt that I do to start figuring out things and then keep redynamizing. Okay? So now I can click on my free self. What I'm going to do is get back that sculpt that I originally had, but then I still have the capabilities to smooth out, and so you can see I have all these horns and start sculpting on them. Okay? So that's really cool, and I want to touch base on that because it does come up um, a lot. So uh, a really good book, Susan, for the beginners is um, Eric Keller's book. Um, Scott Spencer just came out with a book, so I'm going to go to that since I'm here. We're going to go to our third-party training, and we have books coming here. So when this launches, you have books right here. Okay. So here's all the books. Um, Scott Spencer's This Anatomy Book is a really good book. Um, here's a gaming book by Ryan Kingling, um, and here's the book by Eric Keller, which is introducing ZBrush 4. However, he has a new book coming out, I think it's this month, that's on the newer version, which is R3. Um, I myself also have a book coming out next month uh, on ZBrush, which is just tips and tricks, kind of what I'm doing with you guys today. And Scott Spencer just had a book release also, I think, like the beginning of last month or maybe beginning of this month, which if you just go to Amazon, you'll be able to see, excuse my phone, someone's calling through and I can't stop it. Um, so if you go to Amazon, you'll be able to find uh, all these books if you put in also the names besides going to our site there. So that's a great resource for you. So if you put in Scott Spencer, okay, here you'll, you'll get all his books and here's his newest book right here. Okay, so this just released and then you can put in Eric Keller and all of his books will come up. And like I said, he's got a new book coming out uh, soon for the ZBrush one. And then you can put my name in. I hate the shameless promotion, but I, there's, what's cool about this book is I, got, I was lucky enough to get 18 different artists who also share tips and tricks. It's more of a tip and trick book. So that's my book there with the hockey games. So all that resources would be great. Dan, I'm going to come back to your question. I just want to dive into this. I want to get going on this Dynamesh stuff. So let's go back to that alien creature that we're working on since I know now what this does. So what's really key about Dynamesh, for those that are new, is what you're doing, the size of your mesh, is going to become relevant to your resolution. So that's the most important thing is your resolution. Okay. So if I say, for example, drop my resolution, let's drop down to 64 and I start sculpting and I read Dynamesh. Okay you can see that the polygon count is going to get less. So if I even keep going lower, let's go all the way down to 16 and see what happens. So I'm going to scope up a little bit. You can see how low of a polygon count you can get. And in a lot of cases, this is maybe where I like to start. Because as we start to sculpt on here, and we keep re meshing and we keep growing with things, ZBrush is going to keep needing to add polygons to start keeping some detail to our mesh, right? So if I want to, at any time, put up my resolution, I can say, let's go back to 128. Let's start sculpting in here, because maybe I want to start having more geometry now that I do, and start putting maybe some holes in there in the nostrils. Okay? So this incident that you have going on here, this is something that people have ran into in uh, Zebra Central. So what's happening here is I've destroyed the mesh to a certain point, because the only thing that Dynamesh cannot do is it can't do geometry that is laying on top of itself. So for example, if I took um, a plane, okay, like this, this is a flat plane. So this is not going to be something that's Dynamesh friendly, because it's just a flat plane. Or if I took and did something, here, let's do this, and let's really mess this up. So if I did something like this, you can see that this geometry is starting to collide with that geometry and kind of start to overlap each other. That'll start to become a problem because then what we're looking at is, okay, you got geometry going one way, then you have geometry cutting it and going another way. So if you run into that issue, that's all your problem is. So what you're going to probably want to do, so you see, for example, here, there's a hole being created here. 
okay? I can even say this. I can switch to an inflate brush, right? And I can even start inflating this stuff together, right, to try and, and do some fixes this way, right? So you can see what I'm doing here is just fixing this up really quick, and then there you go. So really cool that I can do that in Dynamesh. And now that I have more of a resolution, now I can get back to my sculpting part. Because again, this is Dynamesh. This is about being free and just, just taking your sculpt somewhere and start looking at what I want to do with this creature that I'm kind of making and saying, okay, there's going to be a really large bone that comes across here maybe and comes down into here, and that's where his bone's going to be. And you can see this is the point of Dynamesh. I want to start just thinking about what I'm going to do. I mean, he has a really big brow in here. Okay, so you can see I'm just moving along and thinking about what I want to do with this creature. Maybe the mouth comes way down here, and then this is just all open space. Maybe I'm pulling a little bit from uh, Steve Johnson here. So, and then I just start going through here, and maybe start this. There is a nice big bone that's coming through here. And notice I keep saying bone. This is a key thing too for those that are new to sculpting, especially in ZBrush. Your bone structure is going to be so important what you start doing here with your characters because even though it might not be a human character, you've got to still think about your bone property and what you're doing with your character along the bone, even though I'm intending to start making some kind of creature that's more human. So let's unhumify him more. Okay? So you can see I can start moving around. I can keep moving things. I can even grab something like the snake hook, which is a really nice brush to use with Dynamesh. I can start really pulling on things. Maybe I want this instead. And I can keep re-dynameshing things. So when you're looking at this, we're stretching our polygons and getting going. So I get you guys get the basics, I guess, of what your resolution is. It's also based on the physical size of the mesh itself. So when I start moving and making things bigger, okay, like this, you're going to see the adjustments based on because I am making this a larger piece of mesh. Okay? So you might see things starting to adjust. So that's correlating with your resolution. To make it easy for you guys, I'm going to turn on the floor. Okay, and I'm going to change my axis here. Give me a sec. Let me get the axis that I want. There we go. I want that one. I want that one. Okay, so if you look at my axis here, okay, and if you look at just the grid, for example, think about just think about the grid as a box. Like if it was a cube in here. Okay? The resolution you're setting is how much resolution are you putting in that box across the box. So when you start getting bigger, you're actually, when you start getting bigger, you actually want to drop your resolution. Because if you put your resolution higher, then you're making such a big mesh with a high resolution box. When you're smaller trying to keep detail, that's probably when you want to start putting your resolution higher. But when you start getting big like me, I actually want to stay down further. And something like this guy that I'm making, I'd probably even go this low. Because I kind of want to keep in this kind of pattern when I start using Dynamesh. Okay? So I just want to point that out and give you guys the basics of that. So let's continue looking at what some of these other settings do. And I'm going to bounce back up so we have just a little bit more for these other settings so we get an understanding of what's going on. And so let's take a look at what the group and the polish feature does. Let's first take a look at polish. What this is actually doing is using the clay polish feature, which is right above um, Dynamesh is right above the Dynamesh settings right here, which is our clay polish. So if I turn that on, let's just start using, say, this brush so we can really get some fine detail in here. You can see that this edge is kind of being kept, and so is this edge. So what we're doing, as I start sculpting, okay, these edges that are coming up, the polish is going to try and maintain those edges, and that's what the clay polish is. I like to call it kind of like a, a nice polish. Okay? So when you have that on, that's what you're going to get, which sometimes gives me nice little happy, as, as we like to call them in the art world, happy accents. You kind of start seeing, like, I like this, this kind of line that's starting to happen here. Maybe I want to play a little bit more with that line. And that line is happening because of what I'm doing, you know, with the polish feature. So you see, I start getting kind of nice lines here. And if I start to even change to, say, something like the Damien Standard Brush, I might start doing this and then pulling out things. And you're going to start getting even crisp, more crisp lines, which is sometimes maybe what you're looking for. So that's what the polish feature is going to do for you. Okay? What the group feature is going to do is start helping us. Say I want to start adding things, elements to this. So we have insert brushes. So I'm going to just 
add a I to here. So you can see I have this I. Right now, we have just basic settings on. You can see when I turn on my polyframe mode, I have two poly groups on. Okay? So if I redynamesh this, those are going to weld together. So you can see that there's just one poly group right now. And you can start sculpting on this. So if I turn off my polyframe and start going on this, I can get going and start sculpting. And then I can weld across and start sculpting across those areas. Now if I go backwards, okay, and get back to those poly groups, okay, so we're back to the poly groups and turn our group on, what's going to happen now is when I read Dynamesh, ZBrush maintains that poly group. So in essence, this eyeballs, as you can see, I can still select them separately and I can start using them, as you can see, I mask off the face or I can do the opposite, mask off the eyes, which really becomes a really cool workflow for me to start coming across and doing things, right? So that way I can maybe work on the eyelids of this character and I know I'm not affecting the eyeball itself because of the fact that I'm keeping polygroups on. So you can really start playing with this and getting with it. And I saw the question about anatomy, and no, I don't think you need to know anatomy extremely well. You definitely need to have the basics, but you need to have an artistic understanding of anatomy, at least understand some boning structure and what's happening. I think that's the key point. Okay? I don't think you need to know every muscle insertion point, every origin point, and all the names of the muscles. I don't think you need to know that, George. It's just having a basic understanding of just at least understanding if I'm making this character, I gotta understand that there's some guy, there's gotta be some bone structure to the guy. So I have to figure out, since I'm making some character off the whim, what is his bone structure gonna be? And it's gotta make sense. Okay? Okay, so let me I'm just gonna look through the questions really quick. Is it interesting? Uh, I couldn't say Thomas if we're gonna be throwing in the MMM. There's more involved because again, ZBrush is also is a software rendered application, it's not using the video card. So that throws another thing uh, to the mix as well. As you know. so, so let's continue on. So we're talking about insert brush and we're talking about groups. But what's really cool and what I started having fun, and I'm going to pull them up for you guys, is a hard edge model. So let's say I want to even cut this off. I don't even like what's happening over here anymore. I can use this brush to start cutting things off. Right? And I can say I don't want this and I don't want this. So now when I read Dynamesh, you can see what just happened is these became separate pieces of geometry, right? So you can see that's a separate piece of geometry, okay? So this is really cool to be able to do this. So now I can say, okay, let's, let's keep this part, all right? And let's keep the eye. So I'm going to do this. So now I have just this showing. And I can go down to the bottom of our geometry subpalette and hit delete hidden. And now those are gone. So what I'm doing is using the slice curve brush to even say if I want to cut something off, or I can say maybe this guy's going to have metal, and I kind of want to have a kind of edge here to it, a nice smoothness here to it. And what I'm doing is tapping the Alt key. All right. I also would recommend when you're using this tool to come out of perspective mode, so you're not using any camera distortion. And then let's say I want to cut across here. I can cut across here, or if I want to double tap the Alt key, I can make a hard edge to this. Okay, so you can see what's happening now. So now when I read Dynamesh, these all become separate pieces. And because Dynamesh needs watertight, we're going to close that out for you across the way. So then this becomes really cool for combining with elements, let's say, like using the insert brushes. And let's just say I'm going to use this insert brush as a negative. Okay, and I'm using it as negative, and you know I'm using it as a negative. I don't want to go that deep, actually. You know I'm using it as a negative because this is white, okay? So we're giving you that poly group capability. And we mask everything off so I can start moving things around, okay? So you can see, I can say, I want to do this. Then let's go ahead and read Dynamesh and see what we get. And you see we get that hole that I wanted, but then you still see that the poly groups are still being maintained and that hole is cutting across both poly groups. So this is a really cool workflow to be able to do this. Right, so now I can come in here and say, let's add this as a positive, right? And then there you go. And then this is its own polygroup. At any stage in time, you want to combine, let's say I want to combine this section here, okay, with this section here. All I have to do is tell ZBrush that I want to combine those sections, right? So I have them both 
being viewed. Okay, go down to my poly groups, do a group visible. That way they're the same color. And because I have the group button on, I want to maintain these separate sections. But because now those are the same color, when I read Dynamesh, see they become one. So it's really cool to be able to manipulate this and play with this. Okay, so I really wanted to show that feature because it's really cool to be able to do a group in Polish. Okay, and then the projection feature, I don't really use it that much myself. What we're going to do is reproject any of sculptural change, any of sculpting that you've done into the mesh again when you keep redynameshing, which will make your dynamesh take a little bit longer to do. I don't find myself using it that much, but what I what I want to show you guys is this technique, how it was used. Okay, so I'm going to actually load a project really quick for you guys. So let me uh, switch over to this screen so you guys don't have to watch me go through my desktop. Give me one sec. I gotta hide some things here. So I'm gonna go to pull up a project that I did this Dynamesh technique that I'm talking about with you guys. So I want to pull it up so you guys can just get an idea of what I did and how I use this technique. And then we're going to move on to the noise maker because we're already uh, 35 minutes into this. So give this a minute. And while we're loading this, I want to take this opportunity to look at the questions really quick. There's no toggle. The, the automatic redynamesh Eric is the control drag. There's, we're kind of running out of shortcuts on the keyboard because there's so many features within ZBrush now. Again, how did I make things negative? Uh, I held the Alt key. So I'm going to show you guys. So for example, this, this mesh is pretty much all Dynamesh. So this is an example of Hard Edge. Um, and in my book, I actually walk through some of these tools on here. So for example, if you take a look at this piece here, and let's go to solo mode. So all we're looking at is this piece, right? This looks like it's three pieces, but in essence, it's actually not. It's only one piece. And I actually use the retopologizing tools to use this. And then you can see I'm using polygrouping, and I just use the slice brush and use negatives to do that. So how did I do the negatives again? I just grab, say, here we grab a cube, and I want to do a negative here. I would just hold the Alt key, okay? And by holding the Alt key, that becomes white. Right? And then because everything's masked off, I can move this where I want it to be. Right? So I got that happening. Right? I'm going to clear my mask by click and dragging and then click and drag. And then ZBrush is reevaluating the surface and then it's going to read Dynamesh. And as long as I still have this in Dynamesh mode with the group button on, it's going to maintain my groups and then use that cube as a negative. And I have the Dynamesh turned up a lot because I want to keep those hard edges. So you can see, there you go. So this is a technique, which for me, I'm just doing a hard edge. So I want to keep these hard edge features. So if we go back down to this geometry, you can see what I have turned on. You can see that my resolution is set at 304, which is really high. And the group is turned on. Because I want to keep this looking hard edge. So there's the technique kind of put in practice in a way that you can use Dynamesh, not just for sculpting okay, uh, organic things, but sculpting hard edge things, okay? So let's reload um, that thing that I made for that video for the hard edge, okay? So that we can take a look at what Noisemaker can do for us. So I'm gonna go to my desktop here and I'm gonna take the time to, to also look at the uh, questions coming in. Okay, so we got uh, a mesh here, so I'm going to turn off solo mode so you can see what I have here. Okay, there's where I started. Okay, so I'm going to load where I ended up. Okay, and again, I'm using Dynamesh to do this. So this is my final, which all I did was merge these and then duplicate them. Okay, so if you look at my subbles and you look at this this right here, this is actually a Dynamesh. Okay, that I've just welded together. And I started that technique in turning on Dynamesh and putting things together. And that's how I made that little light thing. Okay? Okay, so let's take a look at what Noisemaker can do for us. And I want to start by showing you what Noisemaker can do for you when you're looking at these planes. So if I turn on surface noise and I turn this on, you can see now I have not a plane drawn across, but I have this pattern that's happening. 
So I want to show you guys how this pattern works, okay, and what you can do for this. And then, yes, you can mask off what Noisemaker will project, which I'm going to walk you guys through. So I'm just going to delete this and start from scratch, okay? So when I turn on Noise, we get our little preview window here, okay? So this is going to work just like the ZBrush navigation window, okay? So when I start taking Noise, so let's just go zoom in really close to here. I can say, well, what if I just want to start, let's say, for example, let's make some kind of broken up metal thing, okay? So I'm going to use the graph, and let's scale this up more, and let's drop the strength a little bit, okay? So you can see I'm kind of making some kind of rusted look to them now. So if I say okay, right, so you can see this has some kind of rusted look to it. So to the question that's up there right now, yeah, of course, I can mask off parts, and you can see how low a polygon this is right now that I have. But you see that it won't matter to the noise itself. It'll matter when it's applied, but not look at it. Right now I'm looking at it more as a bump map, okay? And I'm masking off parts that I don't to have. So here, I'll, I'll switch this to solo mode. So you can see this side masked off. You can see that there's no noise here. And then this, this one right here has all your noise. So what's new is something that I want to also show, share with you guys, okay? Is if we look at the mask section, Watch what I can do now also in here. So just this masked in area. I can tell ZBrush how strong of a mask you actually want the noise to pay attention to. I'm actually going to drop it down. And you can see what happens is the noise starts coming through now. But then I'm going to start using this magnify by mask. And what that does is magnify and change the noise completely. So in essence, it's its own kind of separate scale slider. And you can see that this is bigger than in here. So I can use this same noise and kind of have a blend between different types of noise happening, right? So this is really cool to be able to do this. So I can variate what I'm doing in the noise even by using the mask, or I can tell it no mask at all and just have it straight going across, okay? So that's new to this version and new to this noise maker. But what I want to do is go into the plugin, okay? So it's popping over on my other screen, so let me give me a second. So we got this awesome noise plug-in. All right, man, yeah. So this is completely interactive. Okay, so right now it's on checkerboard. So if I switch to something else, which is my hex tile, and you can see that with this right here, and I'm going to, here, I'll drop the scale down. So let's go to one. Oh, let's go to one here. So you guys can see what's happening to your mesh. Okay, and here we'll, we'll bump the strength up so you guys can really see what's happening here. Okay, so this is the pattern I have. So if I go in here and edit this, okay, and we're looking at my Noisemaker plugin, what I'm going to do is have some of these controls to my advantage. Okay, so what I'm going to do is actually I'm going to switch the mortar color and I'm going to switch the tile color. Okay, and I'm going to say okay. Okay, so that's cool. I'm getting this nice pattern. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to have the curve just reset back to its basic curve. And I'm just going to adjust off. And boom, we instantly now take what was black, okay, and turn it into transparent. So then I can move this down, this curve back down to and say okay. And then there you go. This is how I got that pattern that I got for this mesh. So this is really cool to also use for other elements, okay. So let's just say here, let's, let's grab a cube, okay? So let's just grab any 3D cube, which that's what, this is what I use to even do that pattern. You can see the point. And let's just turn this into a poly mesh. And then I'm going to turn this in because we're discussing DynaMesh. Let's turn that into a DynaMesh. And then I'm going to go to my surface noise, okay? Let's frame it. So we're just looking at the cube and back up a little bit here. And we're only looking at the cube. And let's go to our plugin, all right? And let's take this plugin and go, let's just look at the checkerboard. Yeah, let's apply that checkerboard. Now let's adjust the scales. And here, I'll, I'll up the strength so you guys can see what we're doing here, okay? So this is great. But what if I did that same trick here? Okay, that's cool, right? That's a cool little fun thing right there. So 
I can do it even on a Dynamesh, but what's really cool about the Dynamesh is if I come back here to the geometry and I double click on this sub key that I'm sitting over, what we're going to do is turn the physicalness of the noisemaker and what's being hit into real geometry. So Qbert, doo -doo 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 -doo. that's actually the Mario Brothers tune. But there you go, little Qbert squares. And of course, this is physical geometry that I can switch to and use my move brush on, right, and do whatever I want to this. Right? At any point in time, I can redynamesh, or I can switch to an insert brush, right, and we can say, let's make a negative. Let's see what happens when I make a negative to this, right? And I don't want the surface mounting on anymore. And go ahead and redynamesh that. That's cool, right? Very cool. A little almost uh, Super 8 kind of, right? So there you go. There's another way to use Noisemaker. Now, what I want to touch base on using for Noisemaker also is it's not just about the mesh, the physical mesh itself, because we're running out of time. And I'll stay longer, but uh, I know the guys at Novich have some things to do and stuff we want to take care of. So it's not just about using noise on the mesh itself. We can also go to the brush okay, and start making some custom brushes. All right? Or we can go to the alpha and say, well, what do we want to combine these elements? So I'm going to go to create and click on noisemaker. So I can actually use the noisemaker. Let's say, let's use the noisemaker to uh, make some scales. So I'm going to say noise plugin. Okay, so you can see I get the noise, which is just being shown on a plane. All right. Then I can say, let's go to scales. So that's updated. And let's just go with the default and say OK and say OK. There you go. I just made an uh, alpha, which is really cool. So let's switch to just a simple brush, which is our standard. Let's just look at drag rec, okay? And let's grab that alpha. Right now I only have Z add on, and I can just pull out that alpha, right? And then I can go to my alpha and say modify, and let's tile it. Let's tile it maybe four times, and maybe let's take a look at that. And maybe that's the scale you're looking for. Or let's hold the Alt key, and maybe that's the scale you're looking for. Or, you know, you know what, I also want this to tile three times vertically so that they're just smaller, right? So what I can do now is say, how about we switch it up? Let's switch to dots. Let's go to stroke, okay? And under, under my, my modifiers, I'm going to go to roll. So now when I start sculpting across, I'm rolling across those scales and almost flipping on top of each other. I can then go, you know what, I really don't, I'm not, I'm not feeling this alpha, so let's, let's untile this, and let's make another version of this. Let's go in and edit this, and let's play with this. I, that's a little too sharp for me. I don't like how sharp the scales are, so I'm going to use some of the shading features. So I'm going to enable scale and this feature. So now I have a nice gradient, and I can adjust the strength of that gradient and start playing with that. And maybe uh, I want to have a scale variation in here, so you can see that. But if I'm making something tileable, I won't do that. Maybe start playing with my base color, okay? So it blends a little bit more. You got to see that. So maybe that's what I'm looking for. Then I say okay. Then I say okay, and boom! I just made another alpha now. Really cool. So now I have this alpha to use. So really different looking scales. So it's a really cool way to use Noisemaker to do that. Maybe I want to start playing with my focal shift here, having less of a focal shift. So now I kind of get that roundness here. Or if you wanted to, maybe, depending on what you're doing with an alpha, sometimes I like to bump up my roll-off. I wouldn't do it for this brush, right, because then it's going to have less of a tiling capability. So you see it's kind of doing this. So it's going to be kind of more dots now. See that? Right? So this is all just creating a custom brush and using just all the features that you have in ZBrush to combine these elements together. Okay, so that's really cool to be able to, to take the noise plugin. So on top of that, the noise in. So we looked at it as a applying to a mesh. We've looked at it making it an alpha. Well, guess what? It's also available in the brush palette. So for example, there are some brushes that are pre-made in Lightbox. So here's brush. Okay. And then you have all these brushes at your disposal. So I'm going to go to Noise right here. And here's a brush that we have right here. And I can start, let's go bigger, and you, using the brush to start adding some elements to this. So let's, let's take a look at my brush 
and turning on my noise. Okay, and then we can start adding elements to this. Okay, so there you go. I made a brush with noise. Okay, so not only can you apply Noise Maker to the surface, to an alpha, but you can also apply it to a brush itself. So I want to catch up on the questions because we're also, I, I spent more time jibber jabbering and not entertaining you guys at all. Um, so let me catch up here. Um, can you use polish instead of high resolution to keep the hard edges? You could use polish, so um, the question being asked about that. Um, so if you take, for example, let's take a look and see what polish really does. So let's just take this cube, all right? Let's make it a poly mesh, and then let's turn this into a dyna mesh. Okay, so this is what we have, right? So let's switch to brush insert cube. And let's let's just add some cubes here. All right, I'm gonna turn off solo mode. So when I read Dynamesh, okay, this is what we get. So let's let's go even lower in resolution. Let's drop it to let's go to a hundreds in the hundreds and read Dynamesh. Okay, so now there you go. You're kind of getting around this. So let's see what happens when you turn on polish and read Dynamesh. Okay, so you do keep that hard edge. And what we're doing with polish, if I turn on polyframe mode, you can see we're just trying to move geometry to the edge. So what happens is the corners, though, they don't stay perfectly tight. So that's on a combination of things. I would use a combination of resolution and polish, especially if you look at this area, too, which it's doing a really great job, and I really like what's actually happening here. It's doing a really great job. If you look at the geometry, that's the difference if we turn off polish and then re a mesh compared to that. Okay? So does that answer your question for you, um, Didi? I answered the masking question. I'm new to ZBrush. If you want to scope things like cars, aircraft, computers, what can you start with to get the hard edges? Um, I would start with hard edging. So I have a lot of techniques that I use. I would just start with even prune of shapes like this. Or I would even start, say, grabbing something like even the sweep 3D and doing this, okay? And going down to my initialized states and using the profiles that we have. So let's say I'm making a base for it. So I can pull up something. I can say, okay, let's make a base that maybe our, our guy's going to stand on. And I'll just use this graph to make my hard edging base. And maybe I want this to swoop in, and then it comes out like this. There. Needs a friend. Lamp. Lamp. Okay? And I'm adjusting these dots and making them go from a soft point to a hard point. So if I zoom in on this dot, which I zoom in by just clicking the dot and I zoomed in, so you see that this is really harsh and this is more rounded here. How we're doing that is I just click on the dot, drag off the graph and come back and then now see it's a rounded. And then obviously now I'm getting a rounded piece. And I can say maybe this is what I'm looking for. Then I say make poly mesh. So I've got my mesh here. And then I start using other features of ZBrush. And I do go through this stuff in my book too actually. This is kind of a workflow that I show. I might even want to do something like this, right? Slice it and then say, okay, I don't even want that top anymore. And say, delete hidden, then this is what I'm left with. Perfect, that's what I'm looking for. Then I can start using selection tools, okay? Because I want to move on to more questions too. Um, and say, okay, let's just select this area right here, all right? I'm going to go to geometry, edge loop. I just added an edge loop in there. Okay, I'm going to shrink my selection by holding the control shift and S key will shrink my selection, all right? I'm going to go to deformation, but just so you guys have a visual, I'm going to mask this off and bring everything back so that I can see what's going on. I'm going to inverse my mask because this is the part I want to change. And just under my deformation, I'm just going to inflate and inflate negatively. And then you can see that I start making stuff that has more of a hard edge to it. And then, of course, when I start subdividing up, right, you have things like that going on. Or if I wanted to, Okay, let's go backwards here, and let's look at just this this piece right here. Okay, let's inflate it negatively a little bit, and then let's go to geometry, and let's also add a crease to it. So now when I divide up, okay, you can see that crease edge is staying nice and sharp right there. So as I keep dividing up, that's going to stay there. So this would be a, a technique that I would use for hard edging, for sure, and something that I would start with. 
Yeah, these tips, kind of these tips factors that I'm giving you are definitely in the book. This is this is completely in the book. I show a complete beginning to end of using this. I wish I could show more with you guys. I don't know how everyone's time is, especially uh, Novich's time, but I can get yeah. you. Yeah, Paul, you can go for, I mean, you can go for maybe like five or six more minutes. Um, okay. Doing Ten whatever you want. Day. Yeah. Ten minutes a day. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. All right, yeah. All right, thirty. Yeah. 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 25, 25, 25, 20, 20, 20, 20, 15. Okay. Yeah. Now I'm like the seller. All right. Let me go through the questions here. I want to catch up on the questions. How can you pattern your showing me retopologies to import into another app? Wait. How can the pattern you are showing be retopologized to import into another app? Oh, okay. You're talking about that pattern I was doing in Noisemaker. That once I, if you look at the Dynamesh part, that's completely exportable to any application as an OBJ STL Vermo file, right? But of course, when QRemesher comes out, anything I'm doing, I can also QRemesh it and export it as well. Or it's physical geometry, so I can export anything off to any other external app, use GoZ or anything like that. Okay, so I'm assuming the question is the plugin that ships with the Noisemaker, which I see that was answered. Let me catch up here. Cool tips, man. That's so cool. Here we go. It looks like uh, questions are being answered. What does the timeline for your commercial look like? How soon can I expect it starting? Uh, I couldn't say what the the time frame is for Q remesher. Uh, well, when you start out masking a character using Dynamesh, do you use image planes or do you dive right in blocking the body with just adding detail? Um, I tend to do this. Okay, so for example. Let me show you guys a workflow that I personally like. You can definitely use, there's a plugin called Image Plane in your texture palette here, okay? I do like this because I can transparent the model, but what I find myself using more now is Spotlight. So let me load uh, a tool here that I have. So let me go to my desktop really quick here. Um, and then let me go to my Lion, and let's, here we go, let's just load him. Yeah. So here's a line that I'm just blocking out, right? And you can look, it's just Dynamesh. So I'm just at the stage of just blocking out, figuring out how big do I want to make his mouth open, what I'm going to do, and things like that. So let me show you what I did to start blocking out. So I'm going to go to Texture, and I'm actually going to say Load Spotlight, and I just saved out. So here's Lion, and you can see I have all these images. And I kind of like this, because I kind of like having these images scattered around because this is the way I, I, I like to work. And all I'm using here is Spotlight. And then what's cool about this is I can move them around. I can say, you know what, I kind of like what's happening in this eye right here. So let me let me scale this up right now for now, okay? Because I want to take a closer look. And I can play with the intensity of this, right? And then I can say, boom, there we go. Maybe I want to start sculpting on this. But it's really great. I can even say, well, let's, let's hide some of these right now. They're kind of in my way. So I can move them around freely and start doing this. And move this maybe here and start going. What's really cool about this, I can put this and you can see I can see behind it and even match up the model to the eye, right? And I can use this as, you know what? I don't want to see the whole image, okay? So I'm going to turn on my spotlight radius, okay? And then do, and now all the images disappear, but you see they don't disappear, right? So I can even look at this and in essence start sculpting based on this. Now, when you start sculpting, okay, by default, if you guys are noticing what's happening, the image is actually being sculpted into my guy, right? Which is cool, because maybe I can use this this way as a reference. Maybe I can even do this instead. I can switch to a standard brush, okay? And let's just look at color. I can paint this on, and there you go. Now I can sculpt around that image, right? And start sculpting in. So kind of almost cheating in a way, but hey, let's do it. It's digital. We have this power. Yes, yes. Cheat, all right. Okay? So, and I do weird sounds when I sculpt and noise, so you guys have to forgive me, and sometimes I sing and sing to myself. It's weird watching me sculpt. You don't want to do it. Okay, so what I'm doing is using Spotlight. Okay? So I'm hitting the Z key to come in and out of Spotlight. So in the minute I turn on my Spotlight radius, I'm saying how big of a radius, in essence, a flashlight, to be or spotlight. This is why it's called spotlight. If I don't want to do a spotlight radius, okay, I can turn that off. But then what I can also do is drop the opacity, and maybe you prefer to work like this, okay, and work that way so you still see all the images faintly, and you can still work. Now I've been sculpting with the image and and painting with the image. What if I don't want to do that? So what you would do is you come to brush, 
Okay, and then you go to, into the into the samples, and right here you see the spotlight projection. By default, this is going to be on. So for me, I want that off. Okay, so and I want to make sure that you know make sure that's off on all brushes, so you can see that's off. So now when I sculpt, I'm just sculpting with the brush. So now I can just use this image to start kind of figuring out that eye for my line, right? And then, then there you go. And then I can redynamesh, and then that's there. So here, let's let's paint over this right now, just so you guys can see what's happening. Okay. So what I did is I used these image. Great, I got these images right to just get the basic lion look. Then I saved off another version. So load spot wait. And then there's a roaring version I saved, and boom, there you go. Now I got other images of him roaring now that I'm, I decided to make him being a roaring lion. So how do you get to this point? And then I'll go back to the questions, and, I, and then I'm sure we got to go. I will talk forever and ramble forever. Okay. So all you do is take any texture. You can either import a texture. So if I, let's just grab this texture, and I click on this little icon right here. By default, Lightbox is going to open because they were kind of developed yeah, because I have all these textures I can add as well. And then there you go. We have now the image, and then we can move it wherever we want and place it however we want. And then I can save this out. So all I have to go is texture and do a save spotlight. And what's great about it, it's going to save where it is and the physical side it is in your document. Uh, I use a tablet and it's antique. So does that help, uh, George, with your question to the images and do I block out and things like that? This is the way that I use it. Okay, great. Um, so do you start with thumbnails and drawing for your work? I totally start with yeah, sketching out something really quick and figuring out what I want to do, or I do what um, back to what we started with. If you take since Cameron's also in this meeting as well, right? This right here, what Cameron's doing, where he's just figuring out silhouettes, and he walks in this a nine-minute video, and he's walking you through that, or also on top of that. A really cool technique uh, that Cesar Nicole Jr. uses, which if you go to our community here, we have a user group meeting. There's a video right here of the last user group meeting, and see he's using a silhouette, but this is actually a 3D shape, and he uses a lot of layering and combination. You've got to see this. It's like watching fire. I don't understand why we as humans watch fires for like four or five hours, and we'll just sit and chitter chat around a fireplace, and all it is is fire. But then we'll go to TV and not find one channel on 500 channels. There's nothing on TV. And then we'll go sit in front of a fireplace and watch it for five hours. I don't know. We like to tell stories. It's what we do. It's seriously like watching fire. It really is when he does that demo. So it's really cool. And in the video, we sh it, there's a little snippet of it. And by all means, I would, any class that you can involve with Cesar, kick, hit it up. So that answers that question. Any, is there um, any other questions out there that I missed? I know there was a big one that I didn't have time to read through. Let me go back, though. I'm relatively new to ZBrush and handling all my models in Tumoto. Can you describe the best workflow from mesh starting in ZBrush with Dynamesh to subdividing, texturing, then export to Moto or View? Well, we have GoZ for Moto, so it's one click button. So anything is going to go back and forth between Moto and ZBrush. Anything you do in Moto, you can click one button, GoZ, send it to Moto, and vice versa. Um, so, and we'll send the lowest subdivision levels because Moto can't handle the polygon count. Um, and then if it's a Dynamesh, if you're not animating it, and let's say, for example, especially if it's a hard edge, do you really need to retopo it? The only reason why you would need to retopo it is if it say it's something like eight million polygons, five million polygons. Moto is not going to be able to handle that. So you're going to, and you would not want Moto to handle that because you start doing a bunch of meshes. Does that uh, answer that question again? Go Z is found within ZBrush and it ships with ZBrush. I'm going to turn off Spotlight, which is right here. So you can see when I click on this little R, the applications that are available. So if I click Moto, I can go Z anything over to Moto now. So I can grab this. And it goes the, and I don't know honestly know if I have Moto anymore, if it's running Moto. I have no idea. I haven't been on the PC side for a while. So now what it's going to do is start looking for Moto and then launching it. Okay? So that's what the goes the will do. All right? So, so here is Moto, and there you go. So I do have a working goes the. So see, it just goes the it over. Okay? So you have. Um, also pages where we walk you through some of the stuff. So under uh, products, okay, you have features, and then you can go through here and put importing, exporting, and here's Cozy. 
and it links you to introduction videos and then in action. So you have this uh, information for you for Gozi as well. Okay, Paul, I'd hate to cut you off there, but we reached an hour. And, um, we'll keep going forever. We could. I, th I feel like we could all just sit here and watch you present, but uh, <laughs> unfortunately, I think we're going to have to cut it off there. Um, I think the last question maybe you wanted to answer real quick is, uh, what's the name of your book? Um, it's ZBrush Professional Tips and Techniques. Here, it's, it's still up here. ZBrush Professional Tips and Techniques is available pre-order on Amazon. It says June 19, so as well they'll have it. Here it is. It's just ZBrush Professional Tips and Techniques. And I've got uh, 18, let's see, 18 artists from around the world sharing a tip or two from jewelers, from gamers, from teachers to uh, film guys, and then I've got nine chapters of tips and techniques. Hopefully, let's cross our fingers. Let's hope you guys really take something from them. I really just want to try and dump as many techniques and tips for you guys. And I really hope it is very useful for you guys. So, so again, I want to thank you, Paul. I'm going to switch the screen over to mine and uh, just wrap things up, give a little brief send-off for everyone here. Sure. Um, so, again, Paul. Tremendous presentation. I think I speak for everyone when I say that we were all really impressed. I think everyone took something away that was useful that they can use. Um, and again, I want to thank Jamie for helping out with the questions on online, fielding them for us. Um, again, if anyone didn't get their question answered, I apologize. We just ran out of time. Um, we'll have to schedule another one of these, I guess. Um, last thing I wanted to touch on before we sign off is uh, I want to give a brief little intro on us here at NoBedge in case anyone's unfamiliar. We're the leading online design software superstore. Not only do we have the best prices around, but our staff is extremely awesome, incredibly knowledgeable. We'd love to, for you to call, chat with us anytime. And then, as Paul mentioned earlier in his presentation, we do have ZBrush, the latest version, uh, for Windows and Mac. Uh, we do have a best price guarantee on that, so if anyone's interested in getting the latest version or upgrading a previous one, um, Feel free to email my colleague Bob there. His email is bob at noveg.com. He'd be more than happy to talk to you about pricing or any other issues you had with, with that. Um, again, too, for everyone who was asking, we will be making a recording of this webinar available online. Um, everyone who attended will get an email with uh, the link to the recording, so you'll be able to watch it as many times as you want. It'll be on our YouTube channel, on our Vimeo channel. So. Just check your inboxes for that email. It should be coming within the next 24 hours or so. So, um, yeah, I don't know if, Paul, you want to say anything real quick before we sign off? Yeah, well, really quick. I know people are asking where can we get more of this information, things like this. Uh, does Novich sell to Australian customers, Patrick's asking? Um, you know, I don't think we do. I think we're exclusively North America. Um, I don't know here. I could switch back over to you, Paul, if you wanted to. Um, sure. Uh, yeah, because I did really quick because I came up work and we get more of this information. Da, da, da. Yeah. Well, you guys would probably want to keep your eye on. Let me show my screen. Uh, what screen am I showing right now? Let me make sure you guys are looking at the right screen. Okay. So you guys can see the website. So go to the community and go to the ZBrush blog right here. And anything that we have going on on our websites or any of these. See, so here's the Novage one. Any Anything that we have going on, it's going to be posted in this blog, right, and here's, here's the user group meeting. So we do have other ones coming up, so you'll have to look because we're posting on our blog almost on a daily basis, right? And you want to be, probably become a friend of the Pixelogic uh, ZBrush fan page on Facebook, and we also have a Twitter account as well. So I would become members of that, and then we share all that information on there. So you definitely want to be a part of that, and that's how long you can do. How long do the webinar videos, how long do you keep the webinar videos up, he's asking. Uh, yeah, Steve. Um, forever, as long as our YouTube and our Vimeo and our website stay active. I know, uh, I know the last ones either. ended up getting copied and pasted in ZBrush Central, and it got passed around ZBrush Central. So. Yeah, so yeah, we'll, we'll shoot everyone an email with, you know, links to all the recordings of the webinar and stuff like that, so just, just check your inboxes, and yeah, that webinar will be made available for as long as, as long as you want to view it. Don't forget about Z Classroom for videos. I keep where, where are more videos, guys. There's there's probably about 70 videos in here. So you're looking at you know, that's 50 to 60 hours, if not more, of video. Yeah. 
So yeah. definitely take a look at this. And like I said, we're adding videos on a weekly basis. So it's like it's a growing, breathing um, item on Pixelogic.com. And again, I'm just under education. And I clicked on video tutorials. And definitely. So if you come here to sculpting, and I know unfortunately I had to go really fast through things because I just wanted to try and show it as much as I can. So here's the videos on Micro. I didn't even get to this. How to make an alpha and do this. I only got to that. So you definitely want to check these out. And yeah. I put my email address somewhere in this chain. But if you want to get a paper and pen out, I'll give you my email address. And by all means, you can drop me an email if you have a quick question or, hey, where was that link again for that video? I'd be more than happy to ignore the email and move on to the rest of my emails. So you can email me at, that was a joke, by the way. <laughs> I think we all got email, that. Don't worry. <laughs> you can email me at, this is very, very difficult. Paul at pixelogic dot. Just make sure you email me that you say where you, you met me because obviously I get emails from people all around the world and I, I I'm I'm not good with names. Okay, I'm good with faces. It must be an artistic thing. I'm horrible with names. So uh, make sure you just hey Paul, I was at the Novich one. You're not that funny. You need to get a new career. And I'll say, Great, thank you. Why do you think I'm working here so I can work on my stand up? Okay, so um, let me know if you need have any questions, and I can point you in the right directions too. If you have something you need help with, yeah, def and then in the follow up email, I'll send everyone. Definitely, I'll put Paul's email on there so you guys can get in contact with him. And Tomas, thanks for joining. Another uh, uh, Pixelogic employee was in the webinar as well, besides Jaime. So oh, nice, nice. Okay, yeah. Well, that's funny. Our our sales rep Bob Thayer was actually in the webinar too. So we had a bunch of people attending. So yeah, I don't know if Paul, you want to add anything real quick before we sign off? Yeah, thanks for coming out, and uh, hopefully we're going to continue to do more webinars. Like I said, go to the, the blog, and you'll see webinars happening uh, all over the place. Um, so we're doing them all the time. This is our second one with Novich. Um, I actually have another one tomorrow with uh, a school, with this Escape School, uh, it's, uh, Escape Studios. So <laughs> you go to their site, and they're a school, and I'm doing one with them. So tomorrow. So it's early in the morning, though. It's nine in the morning, my time, LA time. So because they're in England, uh, I I have not worked on any Hollywood movies. I'm just no, yes and no, but no. <laughs> if that makes any sense at all. No, but you can you can read uh, about ZBrush being used in the movie business by going to community and user stories. Yeah, I saw you guys, John Carter. Yeah, we posted about that on our website too. And games, Epic Games, and things like that. That and too, you guys can go here to the industry page, which will link you to other things here too. And here's like the industries, and you can see the movies that we're used in, how we're being used. So, also a very good resource for you. So yeah, I think we'll cut it off there. Um, again, thank you, Paul. Jamie, everyone at Pixelogic for uh, presenting this webinar again, and I want to thank everyone for tuning in and uh, attending another presentation. We will uh, we'll catch you guys next time. Very good. All right, Thanks, guys, everybody. have a great. Thanks, everyone, so much. Have a great night, great evening, good afternoon, good evening, good night. <laughs> All right, take care, everyone. <laughs> Bye.